In this video, I want to present to you the message of the gospel in four points. That's coming up. Hello everyone, my name is William Zulu Agbemi. I welcome you back to Grace Tidings. Today, I bring to you the message of the gospel in four points. Salvation begins by the hearing and believing of the gospel. Without that, no one can get saved. And that is why the message of the gospel is of the utmost importance. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. I need you to pay attention to three points in that verse, Romans 1 16. The first one says, The gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ. In other parts of the Bible, it's called the gospel of salvation. And the second point is the power of God unto salvation. And the third one is everyone that believes. So according to that verse, the gospel of Christ, when it is believed, it will grant the believers the power to become the child of God, the power to receive salvation. That's what it means. And, and that is similar to the point of John chapter 1. In verse 10, the Bible says, Jesus came to this world. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came to His own, and His own received Him not. But not everybody rejected Him. It says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become sons of God, even to them, that believe on his name. So the way to receive Christ is through the gospel of Christ. What that means is when an unsaved person believes the gospel, he hears and believes the gospel, he receives the power to become the son of God, the child of God. As you can see, that is similar to the point of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, which says, In whom ye also trusted. First of all, the word trusted there is in past tense. That means it has already happened to these people. And second of all, the word trusted means to have faith in something, to believe in something. So trusting and believing is the same thing. So you believe, but something happened prior to you believing, and that is that you heard the word of truth according to the verse. It says, after that ye heard the word of truth, and that is the gospel of salvation, in whom also after ye believed. So not only did you hear the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, but you also believed. And then you are saved. That is the point of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. It's also the point of John chapter 1 verse 10 and the point of Romans chapter 1 verse 16. So the process of getting saved is by hearing and believing the gospel. And that is why I want to share the gospel with you today in four points. But before I get to the four points, I want to read some gospel verses to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, listen to what verse 1 says. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. What that means is they have received it, they have believed it, they have accepted it. It says, And where ye stand? Now, salvation is not that you believe in Jesus today and tomorrow you are trusting in your own good works. Salvation is not that you are trusting in the blood today and tomorrow you are trusting in your ability to keep yourself saved. No. When you come to Christ, you remain in Christ. When you trust in the gospel, when you trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, you remain in it because that's what it means to remain in the gospel. You're not stepping outside of your bounds to go and try to work things out for yourself or make sure you don't lose your salvation. If you don't do this, if you don't do that, no. You're supposed to stay in Christ. Christ has saved you. You don't have to keep saving yourself. That's why you need to remain in the gospel. And that is the point of that verse. And verse 2 says, by which also ye are saved. You are saved by the gospel. I'm not the one that says that. It's, it's the Bible that says that. You're not saved by your ability to do this and do that and do the other. And you are not saved by your ability to obey rules and regulations. You are saved by the gospel. And what is the gospel? After telling us we are sinners and that there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, the gospel says Christ died for our sins. And that's the point of verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. He died by shedding his blood on the cross. And it says, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is a simple message of the gospel. It's not complicated. 
So now let me give you the four points. Point number one is that you are a sinner and your sins have price. There are consequences for every sin you commit. There is a price to pay. Everyone who is alive today has sinned. And they've come short of the glory of God. And what that means is that you've been disqualified from trying to redeem yourself by yourself or by anything that you can accomplish on your own. It's not possible. Everybody has sinned. But just in case uh, some people will want to argue that, as a lot of people usually do, I want to share some things with you from the scriptures. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20 says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible says there is nobody on earth that doeth good. Everybody is a sinner. Whether you are black or white, doesn't matter. Whether you are rich or poor, it doesn't matter. You are a sinner. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. But not only that, it says, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10 repeats the point of verse 8. It says, if we said that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Everybody has sinned. But not only that. The sins that we commit, they have prizes, they have consequences. And everybody that has committed a sin and nothing is done about it will face the consequences. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that means that a sinner will die and go to hell to burn for all eternity in the lake of fire. That is what it means to die. Because... When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, that doesn't mean you just die here and, and your body goes to the grave and that's the end. No, your soul continues your existence. And whether you are saved or not will determine where you go, whether you go to heaven or you go to hell. So an unsaved sinner is going to die here and then go to hell to suffer for all eternity. You know, the people that don't believe in that are those that don't believe in hell. And for those people, you will find out the hell is real. Just five minutes, five minutes after you die, you're going to find out that hell is real. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And that's more about spiritual death, not just physical death, that your body just dies and goes to the grave. Your soul will continue your existence. And if you are not saved, your soul goes to hell. But the last part of that verse says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ a lot. So if you are saved, you get eternal life and you go to meet Jesus when you die. So death is attached to sin. In James chapter 1 verse 14, James wrote, it says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. So his point here is that God does not tempt people with sin. He said everybody is tempted when we allow our lust to draw us away. When we step outside of the will of God, Temptation falls in. Guess what happens next? It says, and we are enticed. And then verse 15 says, Then when the lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When you allow lust to grow and manifest through your action, the Bible says it bringeth forth sin. It says, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth for death. That is serious. So imagine the kind of thoughts that come to our heart, to our mind at times. Uh, a lot of times you cannot control what comes to your mind, but you can control what you do about what comes to your mind. If, if there's an immoral thought or there's a loss that is growing in your mind, you can suppress it immediately and not start meditating on it to the extent of actually acting on it. The Bible says when you allow that to happen, you fall into sin. After you fall into that sin, the sin will bring death. And that death, like I've been saying, is not just the death of the body. It's the soul also continuing to go to hell to burn for all eternity. If you don't believe that, let me show you something from the Bible. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. 
The Bible says, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall find their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. When you see people die now and they take them to the cemetery and they are buried, that's first death. But if they are not saved, their soul will die again. Then they will go to hell. That is the second death. That is the true reward of your sins. If you didn't get saved before you die. So number one point is that all are sinners. All have sinned and we've come short of the glory of God and our sins have prices. The second point is there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. You cannot save yourself. I couldn't save myself. Apart from Jesus Christ, there's absolutely nothing that we can accomplish on our own. In John chapter 3, verse 3, this is Gospel of John. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what it means to be born again is that you are born from above. It is the work of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. That has you have nothing to do with it. I had nothing to do with my salvation. It is the this the the work of the Holy Spirit that was done on the basis of the redemptive work of Christ. Our salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit when we believe. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if you try to bypass Jesus, if you try to bypass the cross, you will not get to the Father. You're going to get somewhere else, but apart from the presence of God. But those that want to enjoy eternity with God, they have to go through Christ and not through anything that they do on their own. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus Christ. There is no salvation in anybody else, in anything else, even including you. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Salvation is not by what we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. That's what the Bible says. It says, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse 6 says, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ as Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we are justified by the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we, we are not saved. We are not justified. We are not redeemed by the works of of righteousness which we have done or that we are still going to do. There's nothing we can do about that. It is solely the work of Christ and we have to only trust in what he has done and completed for us. So point number one, all have sinned and our sins have prices that must be paid. Number two, there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. So point number three, Jesus Christ died and paid the price. He paid the price of our sins. He paid the penalty of our sins. Jesus Christ suffered in our place. He suffered in your place. He suffered in my place. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And Jesus Christ loved us enough to come and die for our sins. There is no greater love than that, the Bible says. So through his suffering, his death, his burial and resurrection, Jesus Christ paid the full penalty of our sins and his sacrifice was accepted by God. That is one of the good news of the, of the gospel. That, Jesus, that, that God the Father accepted the sacrifice that Jesus made of himself on our behalf. God considered that sacrifice to be sufficient to pay the penalty of our sins. So the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross is the center point of the gospel. It is what the gospel centered around. Without the blood, there is no gospel. So it is all about the blood of Jesus Christ because without that blood, nobody could be saved. Nobody could be forgiven. Nobody could receive the forgiveness of sins. If sinners have to trust in the blood to be saved, then we cannot preach the gospel without preaching the blood. So the blood of Jesus 
is where we get our redemption from. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 and Colossians chapter 1 verse 14, they both say, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ that we receive redemption, that we receive forgiveness of sins. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So when we didn't know anything, Christ died for us. Verse 7 says something very interesting. It says, For scarcely for a righteous man we won't die. Yet peradventure for a good man some will even dare to die. That may sound a little bit complicated, but what that means is that nobody is ready to die for a righteous man. It says, if you're a very good man, maybe some people may want to dare to die for you. But what about a wicked person? What about a sinner? What about somebody who is who is evil? Can you die for somebody who is evil? Can you even pray for your enemies? A lot of people find it difficult to... To live with people that offend them. Some people are legitimately offended. They were hot. They find it very difficult to work with those people. They can't even stand them. And Jesus, <laughs> he died for us. Not only did he stand us, not only did he love us, he, he demonstrated that love by giving his life for us. And according to John chapter 15 verse 13, it says there is no love that is greater than that. Greater love had no man than these, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that for us because he loved us. In verse 8 of Romans 5 says, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, so the point that I want to bring, bring up from there is that Jesus has already died for our sins even before we were born. If you are alive today and you are listening to me, Jesus paid for your sins over 2,000 years ago, before you were even born. And, and then you see people today that they think they have to do this and do that before they can be saved. And the, 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 the work that Jesus did was not sufficient for them. So keep that in mind. Jesus died for your sins while you were sinners. He did not wait for you to fix yourself or clean yourself up. He already died for you because he loved you. And he wants to demonstrate that love. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, For he had made him to be sin for us. Him is Jesus Christ. Us is you and I. Who knew no sin? Jesus knew no sin. Jesus never committed a single sin. He was found blameless. Even the people that arrested him, that took him to the judge, they couldn't even find anything against him. They came up with all kinds of accusations, but they couldn't substantiate any of them. But God made him to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I had a preacher uh, preaching recently. He was talking about the two transactions that happened on the cross. Dr. Erwin Lusa. He says, two things that happened on the cross is Jesus took our sins upon himself. It wasn't his sin. He did not commit those sins. We committed them. But he took them upon himself. The second transaction is that Jesus gave us his righteousness. And that is the point of this verse. It says he had made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? That we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. That's where we get our righteousness, in Christ. That's because of what he did for us. So point number one, we are sinners. Number two, there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. And number three... Jesus died and paid the price of our sins. He paid the penalty of our sins. Now, point number four is very simple. You must believe in him. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. What it means to believe in Jesus is that you are believing in those three things that I mentioned. Those three points are very important. You have to believe them with all your heart that you are a sinner. You have wronged God. You've come short of his glory. There's nothing you can do to save yourself or you can't pay the price of, of your sins by yourself. If you're going to do that, it means you have to die and go to hell and burn for all eternity. That's how you pay on your own. But Jesus has paid for your sins by his death, burial, and resurrection. That is what you need to believe. And that's how you get saved. That's how you receive the forgiveness of sins. A sinner must believe with all his heart that Jesus Christ died for him. 
and that Jesus was buried and that he rose again for his justification. That is what it means to believe in Jesus. When you believe that with all your heart, your sins will be forgiven. And that is why Jesus died. That is why he shed his blood. That is why he suffered and died in our place. So that when you believe, you will receive forgiveness of sin through the work that he did on your behalf. It's written all over the New Testament. But not only will your sins be forgiven, the Bible says you will also receive the gift of eternal life. That's something nobody else can do for you. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are taken away. You receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ and then you are given the gift of eternal life. Eternity with God simply because you believe in Jesus. Not by anything you did. You didn't pay any price because Jesus has paid all the price when he died on the cross. John chapter 3 verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When you believe in Jesus, you no longer perish. You will receive everlasting life. It is not that you believe today and then you have to spend the rest of your life making sure you do this and do that and do the other so that you can get to heaven. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when you believe, at the moment that you believe, you receive the gift of salvation. And that comes with everlasting life, eternal eternity with God in addition to several other blessings. John chapter 3 verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life. That's simple. It's not he that did this and did that and did that and did this and did that. No. He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life. And it says, He that believeth not, regardless of what you do, regardless of how much you pay, regardless of how much good works you think you have, regardless of your religion, the Bible says, you shall not see life if you don't believe on the Son of God. That's Jesus Christ. It says, but the wrath of God is upon you. The wrath of God abideth on you. John chapter 5 verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is the word of Jesus. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. When you believe with all your heart, you receive everlasting life. And I've already told you what you need to believe. You are a sinner. You cannot save yourself. Your sins have price. And Jesus paid the price when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. I've read it before, but I'm going to read it again. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye had the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And verse 14 says... Which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I added verse 14 on purpose because a lot of people, they don't understand what salvation means. The Bible says we are given the Holy Spirit as the earnest of our inheritance. What that means is it is a proof that we now belong to God. It is a seal of God on us that, that gives us the guarantee that God is still coming to get us. It says, it is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. We are the purchased possession, the Spirit of God that comes into our soul to seal us. And one day is coming that Jesus will come back and redeem us. It's like paying a down payment. That the word earnest there means down payment. Jesus gave us the Spirit as a down payment of our inheritance. And it's coming to redeem us. How cool would that be? Can't wait for that day because that is one of the greatest news of the gospel and of salvation. So believe, put your trust, put your faith in Christ's completed work. It cost you nothing because Jesus Christ has already paid all the cost. So do you believe? If you believe, I congratulate you. But if you have not believed, there is still time for you to believe. You can trust in Christ today and be saved. So don't forget to visit Grace Tidings website. You can read more about the four points of the gospel and several other topics on the website. Remember to share this message with people that you know if it has been a blessing to you. And don't forget to subscribe to Grace Tidings YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, grace and peace be with you in Jesus' name. Amen.